Good afternoon, everyone. Um, last session of the day, so if anyone wants to run out, that's fine. I don't mind. Um, yeah, Binutils, right, so where are we? Binutils BOF 2024. Um, this is obviously a BOF, so the idea is that you guys are going to be involved. It's not just me standing up here talking at you. So feel free to raise your hand, and I'll try and rush around with a microphone. Yeah. Um, but to get things started, I have a, ideas for a, a few future projects for the Binutils. Um, the first of which is linker benchmarking. I've, I've, aha, brilliant, thank you. Um, this is something I've wanted to do for a long time and just never actually had the, the time or the energy to do it. So if anyone is interested and wants to volunteer, that would be even better. But um, it's sort of common knowledge that the BFD linker is the slowest linker of them all, right? And if you want speed, you go with mold or LLD or even gold. Um, but I'd like to know where in the linker things are going slow so we can improve it. Um, I'd like to know if new, linker, new versions of the BFD link are actually better than old versions or if we're regressing. And, um, I'd like to be, and then ideally I'd like to be able to compare our link, the BFD linker with gold and LD and mold and actually have reproducible results. So this, this is the sort of thing that I want to be able to, oh, hang on, I'm losing my microphone. Um, and also an easy way of doing it so that it can be done by ordinary users. And whenever you know we get a, a contribution or something like that, we can run, make check bench or something. Oh, we've already got a. It's not really helpful at all, but just for my own understanding. Because uh, I've seen a. I've seen some patches for the BFD link. I've seen some patches uh, for, for specific for the um, relative relocations. And I've seen mm -hmm. a patch for another port, I think, x86, doing the same thing. And they look very, very different. So that made me, makes me think that the implementations of both ports for the same link are, are quite different. Yes. So do you think the bits that slow thing, uh, do you expect the, the, the performance of these different ports to be wildly different, or do you think? I, I, am, I suspect that, and I'd like to be able to prove it by using this framework and saying, look, the x86 linker performs like this, but if you do exactly the same t test input, but for ARCH64, it actually performs twice as slow or twice as fast or whatever. But yes, um, the, this, the part, part, one of the ideas of this is being able to get data so that we can then look at what, where the slow bits are and what needs to be improved. Isn't the linker, BFD linker, slow on all the architectures compared to this? So is it some common infrastructure? It, um, the common cons it is believed to be slow on all architectures, but um, there, aren't, there isn't a lot of real research into this. I mean, it's probably true, because it is old and it wasn't designed for speed, but it would be nice to actually it, confirm that. One of the reasons is it's also the most full-featured out of all the linkers. Too. Oh, yes. I mean, all the different file formats. Yeah. It's, it's I, not just only to, to be clear, my goal for the BinU tools, uh, for the linker in particular, is not to be the fastest linker out there, but to be the most full-featured linker out there. The, I, my idea is that if you want it done, you can use the BFD linker. You might, you might be slow, and you might, that might be a problem for you, in which case you choose something else. But if you need it done, you need it done right, you use the BFD linker. Features, but also about the optimizations, because a BFD linker perform some optimizations which none of the other linkers do. True, yeah, and and, and it, it originally, well, for a while, it was you know the BFD link had all the features, and other linkers were trying to catch up. These days, we now have things. There were some things in LLD, for example, that the BFD linker doesn't do, and I, I have plans to steal those and implement them <laughs> at some point. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I'm. I want, I want the, link, the linker to be Im improved and, and, and certainly get faster if it can, but that's not the primary goal for the BFD linker. The primary goal is to be able to link anything and get it right, even if it takes time doing it. Okay. Um, so, yes, if anyone's interested in... Oh, yes? No? No? Oh, oh, my mistake. Right. Next, then. What other? Ah, now, Jonathan. Excuse me, David. Why did I call you Jonathan? Anyway, David is implementing this wonderful lib diagnostics library that uh, can emit output in with colored text. Yeah, he's going to do a quick demo. Um, and also, a, a, a real benefit, I think, is it can generate machine readable output. So that you can then have link assembler error messages and linker error messages that can then be brought in, read by 
the VC, V code IDE or what all these things. I think David's going to do a quick demo. If if we can, <laughs> quick live demo. Um, so I hacked up. Uh, oh dear, that's the, that's not it. <laughs> That's that's my that oh, well, actually that is that's my presentation from yesterday and um, in term, basically it provides an API um, a C based API that well it takes GCC's all the code I've written for GCC's diagnostics and exposes it as a um, simple C API where everything's opaque uh, you make a manager uh, you tell it I am for example I'm the assembler or gas, here's my version numbering and other sort of calls to metadata. Um, you make uh, files, you, make a, you can make a text sync that auto colorizes if it's connected to a TTY. You can, but, um, the, the, I think a big feature that you, someone's mentioned, Sarif is the static analysis results interchange format, which is a machine readable yep. format for diagnostics. And um, so you can make that. And then like, let's make a, Represent a location. Let's start creating a diagnostic. It's an error. Let's set a location of it. Let's add a fix it hint. And then we, admit it, we finish it by sending the message as a formatted thing. Um, unknown field, color, did you mean color? And then it, and here's an A dot out, a, a, a simple file. Yeah, that simple file. Um, and I've linked it again. To, well, clearly I'm, I've kind of hacked it together. It's not installed. It's uh, the A dot out is linking against. Um, the lib diagnostics and the working copy. But yeah, it will print the diagnostic, it's got the nice emboldened stuff, it's done the quote substitution, and it's quoting the user's source code, underlining things, showing fix it hints, and then at the end, when, as you tear down the diagnostic manager, there's a hope, for example, to generate a patch for the fix it hints for the diagnostics. Um, Top button. Oh, sorry. There you go. You can. You, you can. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't sure. You're, you're throwing technology. In. Yeah. So th this is a, the auto-generated patch for. Well, there, there happens to be just one diagnostic in this toy program, but yeah. so you can generate patches, um, and then you can generate uh, Sarif. So this is just um, where the, the, the top button. Top one. Hey. Yeah. So there's the error. There's the unknown field color. Do you mean color? It has a physical location. Uh, Sarif supports like logical locations, like if it, is it in a particular function, um, and those are nested. Like is it in a namespace, a class, a function, and and, and yeah, there's the fix it hint expressed in machine readable form, um, and that's not strictly relevant. And the demo for I had together a version of this for um, hold on, I need to close LibreOffice, probably. Do I get, oh no. Um, <laughs> never do a live demo. Never do a live demo. Yeah. I, I have a demo of uh, the glue assembly of, of gas at as new. Um, and basically, instead of using the, um, and I posted a patch for this some months ago to the mailing list. And uh, but basically, you, uh, uh, do you mind if I just quickly? Is it, yeah. Is it easy to show rather than tell? I need to read it. Yeah. Anyway, so while David's doing that, so um, one of the things I wanted to say is this is going to be a configure time option. So you won't, I'm not adding a new dependency on lib diagnostics if you don't want it when you're building your assembler. But I think it would be very useful. And um, gas is, is the, the low hanging fruit target. So we're doing gas first and then then the linker and then all the other tools, read elf, obstop, etc. Um, and the idea being that using this library, you'll have the, um, error messages and warning messages that are, look similar to users of GCC, so that will be familiar to them. It'll be machine, and you can have the option of a machine readable output that can then be consumed by an IDE or debugger or whatever. Um, and basically, all, all the error message handling code in one place rather than scattered throughout the code. So, so here is um, the, exist, the current status quo of what gas emits on a particular, some cases in the um, thing. And then I've got a version linked with um, lib diagnostics that, um, where are we? Uh, again, live demos. Um, so let's turn that off. And 
uh, I think I need, sorry. Yeah. Oops, come here, come here. We're in the middle of a live demo, so uh, yeah. um, here we go. So with this, you'll notice that so, um, there's the status quo output, and then with the diagnostics, um, you get the colorized error um, emboldened thing, and you've got the source quoting going on. Um, there, are, there are some differences. So, for example, you, uh, the, current, the current implementation has this announcement assembler messages, which doesn't have. And it um, also, you spell error with a capital E. <laughs> And uh, we, this with a lowercase e. And we're just looking at the test suite, and it looks like the only thing that's actually checked for in your test suite is, is there a line that has uppercase e, r, r, o, r, and then yes. any of the x passes. <laughs> so all the test suite, suite cases would fail. Um, and, but, this, but I could just fix it to the uppercase, but then I can just corrupt the output and yeah. the test will pass. That's, that, that, that's uh, just a, an implementation issue. We can easily fix that. So. Yeah. And then uh, the final part of the demo is um, that's an emitting GCC-style text. If we do that, it emits uh, Sarah. Um, and um, where are we? I'm in the wrong terminal. Um, let's put it into... Um, did that work? Um, no, because I just found an error. Uh, yeah, uh, but, but, but basically, you can see the, um, yeah, here are the uh, machine readable versions of the, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the diagnostics. And for fun, here is Visual Studio Code, the Microsoft IDE, w with its Serif plugin. And basically, you, it, you can view it, and then it's showing, well, here is the thing, and I can double click on it and go to um, that thing there. Um, uh, yeah, so it's basically, um, and the IDs can present the stuff in different ways. Um, so yeah, I looked at, I, so I've got something kind of works in gas. I looked last night at implementing it in, um, for LD and had an oh crap moment when I realized that made, there's a design flaw in the current <laughs> API, um, which is that the, um, where exactly does the format happen? And every project has its own sort of domain specific language of format strings for its diagnostics. And you're using a subset, uh, the assembly's using a subset of F of printf, yes. right? Whereas uh, the linker has its own rich vocabulary of, of codes. And there's, and, but there's also the, would it be better, GCC, for example, in its diagnostics, um, you see this, these, this quoted text here. Um, when, in GCC, when we made a diagnostic, we have a sort of this percent QS thing, which has international, so it has localized quotes and it puts stuff in bold. And it's kind of, this is code versus prose kind of thing. We make a distinction. Uh, or is this like too fancy and like? No, no, no. Um, well, my my opinion is that um, if we, we we first of all we get the the lib diagnostic support in there, and then we can improve the quality of our diagnostic messages by, for example, using percentqs well before we're using percent s. Yeah, I mean, right now lib diagnostics is out of tree. Uh, it's yeah. not in GCC yet, and we're not sure quite what the strategy is. Uh, Lib diagnostics messages look lovely. There is one notable way in which they look worse, which is that error is very hard to read because red on black is a hard to read. Is hard. Presumably, the colours are customizable. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and yes, you can you can specify what colours to be used in what contexts. Yes. <laughs> and you can set it up in your environment, so you don't have to set it up on the command line every time. <laughs> Oh, okay, there you go. Uh, my question was, was how it would be used, uh, used in binutils if you build a shared library in GCC and then just configure binutils to use it, or if because we use basically the same tree, 
it would well my, my my big hope is that the lib diagnostics will become its own separate project not part of gcc necessarily but that's a, f a future hope i think yeah, that it's not, yeah, it, it, it's still a mess. Uh, right. And so the interface I'm exposing by is different to the one that is exposed internally of that GCC. So I guess at the minimum, it would be uh, lib di diagnostics devel, which is like a separate DSO, separate header that gets installed, which then the utils can use. It, right. It's a top level directory inside of GCC, perhaps for the start. Right. Yeah. The issue with doing that is, yeah. Um, the issue with doing that is you get there's a huge there's basically a whole set of dependencies inside GCC and this is the bin utils buff and I'll happily have a discussion about refactoring GCC and modularizing it but I don't want to take <laughs> too much of your buff. Um, okay. But I will if you, if, no, okay. Right. No, well, that's it. Okay, so should we move on? Or are there more questions on? Thank you for the, the demo. Will it come back or not? Ah, fantastic, superb. Okay, so, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not keen on this idea. Um, one of the problems with having multiple linkers is that they all have their own personalized selection of command and options and syntaxes. And it's very confusing if you want to switch between linkers, unless you're doing just basic ordinary things. So is there some way to make it easier for users to do so? Um, I don't like the idea of a meta tool or even a, some kind of committee, but maybe a, a web page, a wiki page or something saying, you know, if it, this, these, these, these are the equivalences for, for when you want to do things to make it easier for users. Something like that could be done. Um, I don't know, does anyone have an opinion? Does anyone think there ought to be a magic tool that just converts things for you? No? Good. That's right. <laughs> oh, Florent? Should just go into the compiler driver? Um, well, which compiler driver? Both of them. <laughs> what, but then what about mold? I mean, do you know, or what about gold? Because gold also has a slightly different syntax from the BFD. It, 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 it doesn't, ha doesn't behave exactly the same way as the BFD linker. Well, that's coming up. It's coming up. It may even be on my next slide. Um, but yes, so yes, you can do a lot of this in the compiler driver, I guess. But I think it would still be useful for people who, who encounter this problem who are maybe writing their own assembly code or something like that. Would that also not imply that the driver has to at runtime detect what linker is being used to know how to translate files? Technically, that's also the, already the case, so that uh, because they have different features, if you have different versions installed, so I don't know how well we handle it in practice. We, don't, we, check, uh, we check for the linker which is used during the build, GCC, and we assume all those features. They'll be the same. The yeah, linkers. exactly. <laughs> so, yes, there be some more code there. Uh, okay. So, uh, I'm just going to oh. say that GCC's approach, as Jacob just mentioned, is uh, uh, dodgy, I yes. guess I would say. <laughs> um, it, it works okay for gas. Uh, so, for example, I actually recently hit it with uh, the basic four changes, which is fine, because mm -hmm. I downgraded video source for something else. Uh, uh, gas. But for LD, it's a far bigger problem, right? Yeah. Because the options aren't compatible, but yeah. also re people can and do change the linker, and it may not always be specified with the FUs. Well, be... Ten times more gas checks than yeah. a linker. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so that, that's a, it's, it's more of a, a hand-wavy idea than a concrete plan. Ah, right. Now then, one of the problems we have with the binutils is that quite a lot of the this assembler is created using tables that are auto-generated from input files. And at the moment, we have to regenerate the, the, the generated files at commit time or 
um, rather than at build time. And that means that if you have a patch that changes the, sort, the input to the generators, the, the diff is actually huge because it has all these changes, these great big gigantic tables that really you don't want to know about. And for me, one of the biggest problems is that it makes, really hard, makes it really hard to backport a patch to older versions of the bin utils, which is something I have to do in my Red Hat job a lot. So why don't we auto-generate source files that need auto-generation at build time rather than commit time? I, I see nodding heads, so this looks like it might be a good idea. I think that's not to burden all the users of the bin utils or GCC or mm. whatever project, so that uh, you only need the extra tools, and we, we have really many dependencies, at least on the GCC side, uh, unless you are a maintainer or unless you ex uh, right. change those files. So yes. you don't need uh, autogen unless you mm -hmm. change the top level make yeah. file and, and so on. And, and if oh, Richard or oh, 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 Karen? So one thought I had in that direction is um, to be bimodal. Regenerate, if we know, the, uh, if we figure that the generated file is too old, mm -hmm. but use the generated file if it's fine. So ah, okay. redirect the source of what is going to be further compiled or whatever mm. to the output directory if something needs generating or take it from the source directory if it's up to date there. That would, at but the same time... The generator anyway. yeah. uh, what, what, the, 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 what, one option is, is if, you, if you simply don't ship the generated files in, in the, for instance, in the snapshots or in Git, mm. and then when, when creating tarballs, you actually generate those files. I th we, we do that for, in, in GCC for a couple of things, but... Yep. The problem is cross-building. If the generator programs are written in C, you need to use a native compiler to build the generator programs. Yes. Um, or you have to use something like a scripting language, possibly Python, um, and that means you've now got a dependency on another tool in your build system. Yes. Uh, there's no perfect solution. Uh, I would dearly like to get rid of the generated files. They're just a mess, and a, they just make everything horrible. But there are costs associated with it. Yeah. And that's why we've sort of shied away from it in the past. Mostly. Um, oh, I seem. Uh, I see. I seem to have mostly C gen. So, uh, we've actually got a, 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 another slide talk which I mentioned C gen and deprecating that as well. So, make for it could help if there is just a script regenerate everything that can be regenerated. And, and you just run that script on, on each of the backports. Yeah. yeah. You can do that. This maintainer mode already in Yes, place. exactly. But the problem is that maintainer mode is a pain and it doesn't work properly with the CI systems. Right. Because when you enable maintainer mode, other things <laughs> behave in a different way. Yeah, which is why it's such a dedicated. Uh, regenerate target is probably something that is useful in any event, right. no, no matter what direction we go with the generated files. Okay. Everything that can be regenerated. Yes. Uh, uh, what tools currently we need to Ah, uh, well, cu yeah, cu currently there are, there are bash shell scripts, there are C programs that have to be built to then gen do the generation. The C gen, which is scheme, I think. Um, is this a, I don't know if there might be something in Perl as well. I think that's one of, one of the things in the assembler is written in Perl, like one of the generators. I mean, it's a pain. <laughs> so there, there are several different cases of generated files. So, for example, if the build is generating files in the source directory, that's more problematic than generating things in the build directory, especially because when we do things like when I do a build by the ulipses.py, I'm building lots of different configurations yes. at once. I don't want multiple configurations trying to overwrite the same file mm -hmm. in the source directory. Yep. Yes. Then the configure the configure and build scripts, everything you need to 
run the configure, make, make install uh, more problematic to remove from Git than the other things. Because other things in principle, it's just you've got some extra dependency in order to configure, make, make, install. But the actual process for configuring and building is just those same commands. Whereas if you remove the configure scripts from Git, that complicates things in that now anyone that's building doesn't just need to install some dependencies. It's there are additional commands that need to be used whenever you're building from Git, except that if you're building from a release table, you no longer have those commands. So suddenly you've got different sets of commands depending on where you're building from. And in addition, the configure scripts have a further problem, namely, if you wanted to remove them from Git, namely that we don't want to have to update all the different components in lockstep. Updating them is quite involved. It helped a lot for some previous updates. Say someone did the big utils and GDB update, and then I use that as a basis for doing the update for GCC of the Autocom 4 to make. So you don't want to have to really don't want to have to install multiple versions of a regeneration dependency if you have different ones for big utils, GCC, GLibsy, and so on. Yeah. So anything where there's some dependency for regenerating things, you really, really want to be sure that newer versions of it will work as well, that you're not removing something from Git while also depending on an exact version for regeneration. I, I think we can say we definitely won't touch configure files, at least, at least as a f first pass of this. That's just too complicated. I just want to say really quickly that we're not in a position to remove configure and stuff anyway because we're using a bundled ancient lib tool, which we really need to try and detangle anyway. Yeah. 269. Yeah, so, so not configure files, just not, source files. The reason I ask is because there is a difference between seldom changed files like makefile.tpl.def and .in in the mm -hmm. top level and something like uh, Lexer in AS. Yeah. So that also changes how we should treat them, I think. If it's something that's part of something that frequently changes like AS, it's probably uh, best to do that hybrid thing where we require developers to install a tool. Hmm. We have the disk check step pre-generate those files, but we don't commit them in Git because that's a pain to backport. But for something like a makefile.in that requires autogen, which requires a, 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 a guy at one point something, I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, it'd probably be best to avoid it. Plus, most developers won't need to, do, yes. uh, to change it. Plus, backporting that almost never happens. So yeah. there is a bit of a difference there. Yeah. That's why Agreed. I asked which file specifically. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so yeah, not make files and not configure files, at least for now. <laughs> I mean, may, maybe in the future someone will come. Yes, yeah, okay. And as, uh, this, this is just. Uh, this is. I'm not saying this is definitely happening. This is. This is a future plan. I would love to do it or have someone volunteer to do it. And the regenerator uh, build mode, like we have for GCC. Uh, no. For binutils. Uh, I don't know. I don't believe we do. I mean, I does the Sourceware CI? Run the regenerator? I don't think so, but I'm not sure about that. Right. Okay, so no. This is exactly the same problem as we have with the auto generated files where we turn MD files into C. It's that sort of problem. It's, yeah. We're not talking about anything more. We, you know, it would be like checking in the output of the uh, gen RTL into the, into the repository. We don't want to do that. And that's what we're trying to get rid of. Yes. Yes. OK. What's next? Ah, releases. Um, so what have we got? Um, I, I still want to get rid of gold, but um, haven't managed to do so, anything so far. But what, what about if we move gold into its own release? So it's not part of the, the Binutils tarball. It's now the Binutils gold tarball, for example. Oops. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, gold have its own release and then never release it. Yeah. Is that? <laughs> this is the plan. But see, what 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 I'd like to do is um have have it in a separate release, then reduce it to one release a year, and then one release every five years. No, something like you know, gently retire it. I admired. <laughs> I admire the idea, but you're going to make people think it's alive. <laughs> well, okay. How how else can we get the people off gold? <laughs> <laughs> well, another one of the things I think was what if you run gold? If it, what happens if it emits a warning saying this linker is no longer supported? 
choose use something else. All right, sorry. And you can't get rid of that warning. If, if it's a warning, everyone ignores <laughs> it. We'll ignore it. Yes, if it's a warning, everyone ignores it. <laughs> so you're, you're going to you're going to traumatize Florian and I because you'll end it, up. It does. Yeah. yeah, it does right now. But it's so yeah. We can't to make it uh, <laughs> make it make it deliberately <laughs> broken. And if it actually is unusable, mm -hmm. it's easy to get rid of, right? Well, yes. No one is using it. No one can use it, so no one is using <laughs> it. So it's quite I'll, the, I've, well, I'll say something about that in a second. You do what we've done before on other projects is you fork it into its own project. You have people there that care about it. And when they don't show up, it dies, right? Right. Okay, so with regard to your proposal, mm -hmm. you fork it into a new project. You don't get a release and you wait for someone to step up and do that. Chances uh, are no one's going to show up. Yes. Okay, now with regard to warnings, you're going to traumatize Florian and I. You can't uh, emit warnings when you call LD. You'll, you'll confuse various things, configure okay. tests especially. Even if, they're not, even if you're not emitting an error, it'll confuse something. With regard to gold in general, now, this has been an, an issue for us, so we started phasing it out. Uh, what, one interesting thing we found uh, is that some stuff has it hard-coded to try and use gold. I think... Um, the Apple language, uh, so, Swift. So, so Swift does that. But okay, Swift. You know who cares in a way. And that, no, but another issue is sold on uh, uh, Go on ARM sixty four, I believe, still or Go on ARM or ARM sixty four still tries to use gold. So we need to resolve that. There's a bug where I've spoken to Ian about it, and we had a bit of a back and forth, and he agree he, he essentially agrees that it needs to go, but it just got a bit bogged down. So we need to look at Go. In terms of Sorry? Do you mean GCC? No, I mean Go proper. So for linking Seago, it uses gold. So it matters far more. Um, the other thing I'd say is make a configure, make configure like bailout if you enable gold and like have like enable gold really or something. It's cheesy, but it'll work. And it, no, but it does the job of telling distributions yes. that you should get off this or tell us the problem. Yeah. And I would say that that's the most important thing. You want people to come to you now and tell you the problems rather than yanking it immediately, but I, I do yeah. think it needs to go. Okay. So I, I like the idea of forking projects. That's probably one, uh, that's probably the easiest way to do it and, and most effective. But if you had to have flags, a configure flag is probably not as useful as you think for to tell, to tell distributions that this is gonna go away soon because uh, that's gonna happen once in your configure whatever script, and then you're gonna forget about it. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, uh, if we don't fork, a deprecation warning is probably a better idea with a flag saying disable deprecated warning. So that becomes a, a, a constant reminder that you, you have that flag in there, uh, which, uh, which you're using to build every single time. And, and hopefully that will uh, get you off that sooner. Okay. Um. Do we want an alpha only release? I think no, but I'm just I'm putting that up there mainly to try and get the audience to raise their hands to say how dare you. But uh, <laughs> um, my my thought would be um, less source code. If if you could have a release that only has not necessary for alpha, nothing else, you'd have a smaller footprint. So the only benefit is that it, it is slightly less disk space and slightly yes. less. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> anyone cares. Yeah. <laughs> for, for just in the past, we shipped those many tarballs, this front end and this front end. Yeah. We stopped doing that and nobody complained. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I wasn't expecting We stopped doing it. We stopped doing it because no one actually was using it. Almost no one was actually using it. So, yeah. If I put in effort. <laughs> All right, so what about, oh, hang on. Sorry. Would ELF only actually work even for Linux targets? Don't, aren't things like PE needed for some <laughs> EFI bootloader stuff? Yes, <laughs> you're right. As I said, this was mainly to try and get, rile up the audience a bit and get people talking. Anyway, what about, um, are two releases a year enough? Do we need more? Do we need, is that too much? An elf only release would it still support uh, some other targets like binary? 
Well, no, would be in well, theory. But well, this is just that, that, <laughs> ma that makes the elf only version completely useless. useless. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, look, let's just consider them on scratch, right? Not happening. Um, anyone got any comments on how often the releases happen? I, I, I chose two, two a year because that fitted in with the Fedora release schedule, so it works for me. But does anyone need more releases, less releases? All right, okay, I want. Fine, 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 fine. Okay, what about deprecating targets? This might be more interesting. Um, should we deprecate targets that don't have a maintainer listed? Yes. <laughs> that seems easy. Or what about targets that have been deprecated in GCC? So much. <laughs> Don't um, th targets that have been de deprecated in GCC may still have a compiler elsewhere. They yes. no, may still want Gus as the assembler. Mm -hmm. So I think they should be pretty much independent. There may be reasons to tie them together, but in the common case, I would not. Yes. There is only one reason to deprecate any target. If it costs you something and you don't want to pay for that cost, that's when you deprecate the target, right? Right. Uh, something that doesn't cost you anything, why would you deprecate it? It always costs well, something. If, 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 if you spend all the money for the starch, it costs you. Yeah, yeah. sure. Joseph? But, but this is the big reason. If it, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, 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 if it causes a problem, like there is no maintainer for it and it needs a maintainer, deprecate it. If there is a reason. Didn't you pass the same experience with so there's a difference between deprecating in JCC and never supported in JCC in the first place, which you don't. Because, <laughs> yes. yes, some targets, if targets be deprecated, if that's an indication that people aren't really using the architecture anymore, maybe that's grounds for deprecating in big utils. On the other hand, I think big utils say has various small 8-bit, 16-bit targets, which oh, yes. are very much usable just with an assembler of a link, and you may never have had a GCC port and not so much need a compiler port, or if there's a compiler port, maybe it's something completely different like SDCC. Yeah, agreed. Even more controversial. I'm being the controversial this week. <laughs> um, how about integrating bin utils with GCC so we eliminate the version skew problems? <laughs> Ooh. Uh oh, what? What? <laughs> well, no, okay, I hadn't thought about this, but is this a good idea? What, what do you people think? I, I mean, I'm not so keen, but I, I'm willing to listen. I'm doubtful of actually integrating them. I do, however, think, and this strictly is a GCC comment, not a big retorts one, that GCC should be a lot stricter about saying there is this minimum Bing Utils version for all targets that use Bing Utils. So you can't use, so say you can't, at least say you can't use Bing Utils that's more than five years old with this GCC version. And almost all GCC targets are ones that just use Bing Utils. And this would yes. no doubt eliminate certain complexity for the documentation, quite likely other complexity. If we said in GCC, this is the minimum Bing Utils target, Bing Utils version, except for the handful of targets that don't use Bing Utils. Frankly, I'd go further and create a libgas that's actually built into GCC so that we don't have to write out assembler code. This has been suggested before. <laughs> I do somewhat agree that there is not much point of merging the code bases back together if they are not going to integrate as libraries or something. Mm -hmm. I think without that, it's probably just mostly churn. Uh, like, if Binutils is still going to be developed entirely, well, independently, we, we still do cross-collaborate, but we aren't linking it together, then it's mostly just needed to rebase more frequently and release on a different schedule right. without m any other benefits or any benefits. I just want to say, uh, to the point Joseph made about uh, Binutils versions, uh, I've hit issues before where I've, I think I reported something on Spark and Richie couldn't reproduce I and mean, we couldn't figure out why. And it turned out that there was a configure check as to where the, the vector instructions got admitted. 
Um, but the point is, when you have these configure checks, like they're hidden, people don't realize they exist. Yes. And if we just said, oh, you need a Vinyl's version, which is at least three years old or five years old or whatever, you, you make this obvious and explicit. I had no idea these checks existed. Richie didn't. Yeah. But, but right now, in, we actually support uh, quite old Vinyl's, at least because on GCC farm, we all use those GCC 4.8 compilers and, and Binutos from the same era. So, yeah. so that's quite old. And it works. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to say is I'd rather suggest splitting GDB from the rest of Binutos if there wasn't a dependency on the libraries. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you configure, and then like four options, I think. No, oh, no, 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 that, 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 I, I, that, I, then suddenly, it fills in like 10 seconds. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, uh, I was rather thinking about really splitting repositories, not so much. Uh, I know of uh, yeah. building things separately, but. Um, there is no direct benefit to splitting the repository. The problem is the BFD's lack of a stable API. It doesn't. It doesn't change all that much of. Yeah. It it it, it, it is tweaked here and there, but it's true. It doesn't. It doesn't often. Get, it doesn't often. I suppose. I suppose. And we make no guarantees that it'll be stable. Oh, do you? Yes. The ways that affect, the affect GDP. <laughs> Yes, we have. <laughs> Okay, so what about CGen targets then? Should we just say CGen last release 10 years ago, was it? And there's been some development, but it hasn't had any releases for years and years. So should targets that use CGen, should we just deprecate them? Or should we bring CGen into the bin utils? Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> I never think CGen is a good idea. It's easier to write the assembler, disassemble all the stuff by hand. And it's pretty trivial to write it by hand if you know C at all. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, that's, that's uh, if you're an experienced coder that's done this before, before, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and CTN is very annoying <laughs> for, for people who don't use CTN. CTN mm -hmm. is very annoying. And so, so, does anyone here use CGen targets? Targets that have been that are used the CGen format. Anyone using? Oh, I'm trying to remember. M32R is it? Uh, um, FR30? Anything like that? Any any of the small ones? No. Okay. Maybe it's something to look at then. Um, and another, th oh, getting back to this adding warnings, if, if we decide to deprecate a particular target, should we, oh, there's a configure time warning saying you're building for a deprecated target, are you, do you really want to, and you can add a magic option. But users don't get to know this. Should we be advertising this when they use tools that are deprecated, saying, Look, hey guys, unless someone wants to volunteer to become a maintainer for this target, it's going away. Then an extra countdown. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> Linking tick, red tick, characters. Tick, tick, tick. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, of course, but then isn't that a good thing? I mean, we want someone to say, oh, no, no, this is important. I will volunteer. I will step up and become a maintainer so I don't have to suffer this. Yes. Okay, fine. I'll we'll make it an error then, a, a, dis a disableable error, but an error. I think, I think a warning is still worthwhile because it, when people compile things, sorry, uh, when people compile things, the assembler warnings are omitted, and this means end users will eventually propagate up to people who can, uh, propagate this for the fact that hey, you're about to deprecate this up to the distributors who these days are doing the configure and building uh, and and presumably ignoring the configure warnings for these deprecated targets. We, uh, if, if you don't emit a, uh, emit a warning, the users will never know and things will just vanish on them. Um, I think, we, I, I think a, a warning is necessary. Obviously, it can't be an error or you break people, but a warning seems reasonable. See, it would break people using error, but... error and runtime watch. Yeah, I think so. Florian? I suspect that people on... Deprecated targets don't upgrade that often, right? I mean, they will. Which is great because if you don't get anybody saying, hey, I've seen this message, then you know it's safe to completely remove the target. 
right? If they're not, yeah, if they're not upgrading, upgrade, that, so yeah, yeah, yeah well, they just, come maybe come five years later and wonder why the, where the port has gone, but yeah, yeah, there's nothing you can do about it. So I think cross targets do upgrade. It's also not impossible to, to resurrect targets. Oh yeah, <laughs> totally. Okay, what do we got next? <laughs> ah. Right, so the usual plea, more maintainers please. Um, Alan has retired-ish. I'm going to retire one day, when, when my son gets through. <laughs> Sorry? That was gonna be my bullet that I was gonna ask. I was, I'm glad you brought that up. Oh, right, right. <laughs> the phase was Nick not retiring. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, 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 <laughs> well, my, my, my son is still going through school in uni, so you've got a few years, but you know, once he's done that, uh, anyway, yes, yeah, I, I have, I, we're getting a bit old, I have to say. I mean, there are so, some fresh new young faces here, great, but I, I would guess that the average age of people developing in the GNU toolchain world is just going up and up and up at the moment. So anyway, um, yeah, patch for you back. Well, that's my fault. It's because I'm too busy doing other things. Uh, oh, what to do if a maintainer is in, uncontactable? I, ne I need to put out a, a proper, yes? So I wanted to get back to the patch review backlog. Uh, do you want to, uh, I don't know, nominate more people, empower more people to kind of do patch reviews, mm -hmm. and do patches and so on and so forth, like, uh, so that it doesn't get on you or Alan or HG. Right, I mean, th this isn't a, a Binutil specific issue though, really. It, it is not, no. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I've done things, I've written pages in the wiki about you know, how, how to contribute patches, what, what you need to do. It doesn't seem to have had a great deal of a, a positive effect. No, I, mean, I mean specifically reviewing patches, like empower more of the regular contributors yes. to review more patches uh, and not Which just... Requires contribute. regular contributors, contributors, first of all. Yes. <laughs> I, I haven't seen too much of a problem on the, on the review backlog. My, my, my worry about the top one, and I tried pleading with Alan not to retire, but <laughs> it didn't seem to work. And luckily, uh, he seems to be in the community, which makes me happy, and he answers my emails still. Um, what I'm worried about is, is the, the knowledge of yes. the linker itself. I, I'm not too worried about gas and that, but the linker... All well, that I, I, I will now Where, publicly how? confess my, my secret shame. I'm not an expert in any area of the, the binutils or linker. Okay. Every time the question comes, I look it up. So Alan's it. <laughs> so if Alan gets hit by a bus, it's well, I know, the whole thing is I know where to look. That's the, that's the knowledge I can pass on. <laughs> I'm just wondering, is there a way somehow the people with the institutional knowledge of the linker can... Mm teach other people younger that can take over eventually and yeah. get that knowledge like Alan has on, yes. on, on some yes. of that stuff. Well, you need some secret group where you chain up the old That's the way to do it, but I, I don't think there's any other way. So I guess we had, we had a bit of a, a situation like that back in 2010, 11 uh, in GLPC where we had a, an abrupt change of maintainership, is what I'll just say. <laughs> and what happened with that was that a lot of institutional knowledge was lost. And I think between a bunch of us, we kind of relearned that knowledge over like 10, 12, 15 years. Uh, what was required to enable that was a, a slight drop in conservatism. So uh, we were fairly conservative when it comes to accepting patches into GCC, accepting patches into Binutos, and, and like pretty much all of the tool chain. Uh, we have raised that conservatism again in GLFC because now we have a distributed pool of knowledge that, that kind of uh, knows what's going on across, uh, across the library to a great extent. There are still uh, parts of the library where, you know, sometimes Florian and I sit and we're like, are you sure this is right? Florian says, looks good to me. And I say, it looks good to me as well, so let's put it in. And then if it breaks, uh, we're around to fix it. So maybe there's, there's a yes. slight attitude, yeah, okay. a slight attitude change yes. that we, yes. could, we could have in the review workflow where it's okay to do like a 90% review, yeah. have it go in, break, and fix right. it again. Yes. 
as a relatively recent contributor of a giant pile of not originally GNU sort of, uh, um, uh, uh, source to bin tools, I thought that, and, and of some stuff to Glibsy, I thought I, f I found the um, bin tools conservatism level now to be comparable to Glibsy's now. There isn't a massive pile of, uh, a massive pile of petty fogging. Everything he brought up was actually a real problem. And in some cases, when it was put off, it probably became a problem six months later, so I should have dealt with it earlier. <laughs> um, it's, there doesn't seem to be any problem that the, uh, the ad bin tools attitude appears to be you can put it in, and if it doesn't work or isn't useful, we'll just take it out again, which seems like the right approach. Yes. Um, I think there should be a bit more conservatism in are you going to make this change that silently makes gas misassemble code or something like that. <laughs> but for, 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 for other stuff other than that, the conservatism, the conservatism level seems about right to me. Glibsy yeah, needs to be more yeah. conservative because you can destroy your system instantly if it goes wrong. <laughs> so on that topic, or at least a related topic, uh, one thing that I've noticed as someone who is relatively new to tool trains is that it seems to be a lot harder to come upon knowledge on how the linker works and how the linker interacts with other parts of the system, mm -hmm. then that is the case for, say, the compiler or even the assembler. Both of those components seem to have a lot fewer things going on, even though they are technically more complex. Uh, and I think the source of that is probably just there not being like one place where all the relocations specified, all the sections are specified, all the ELF types and stuff like that are specified. I don't even know to enumerate the full list of problems because I'm, I'm not sure what the scope is, but it's the kind of thing I've noticed. Okay. So, so there's a Mastodon handle, MattDP. I do not know the person behind that. And I, I, if I ever come across, I want to thank him. Uh, he has this wonderful GitHub uh, project, which lists down every single uh, useful tutorial about anything in toolchains. And it, it is a fabulous project, uh, if I can find the link. But I don't know how to put that into, like, how to make that common knowledge. Again, it, it's kind of tribal knowledge at the moment. Uh, for the digging knowledge out of the previous uh, or soon to be retiring maintainers, I would just know that if you want to grab some knowledge, it needs to be done fast because if you ask those maintainers after 15 years, yes. they, will don't, they yeah. won't remember anything. Absolutely, yes. I'm skipping, skipping ahead since we're almost out of time. Um, sorry. For uh, it's, it's very hard to write some uh, new, new backend, just a backend for, uh, I don't know, LD. Uh, because what you do, what most people do anyway is uh, copy some yes. other for some other target. And those are not good examples usually. Yeah. They, they are written with the old interfaces and uh, whatever. It's not what you... And there, there is no good manual how to do it. No, well. there isn't. It, it, it is a, more of an art form than a well-specified... And also, you often Three. just don't put the effort to outline the common parts between yes. the different uh, yeah. backends. Right, well, oh, last comment then. Just one auxiliary comment, maybe. Uh, well, on the other hand, then comes a guy from Japan, I think, Rui Oyama, and writes the mold linker, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, not out of nowhere. Yes. So apparently it's possible to... Oh, it is possible, yes. If you're motivated in general, well, and you have yeah, the skill, then yeah, linker, totally possible. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we're out of time. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming to the conference. Thank you for using the vineyard tools. Have a safe trip. <laughs>